Janet Forrest. Welcome to The Shelves of Yore. Last week, we caught you up on what happened on Nantucket and at the Athenaeum in the six decades between 1841 and 1900. Now it's time to dive back into the stacks and take a closer look at the writers included in the catalog of 1900, starting with the most famous woman you've never heard of. In 1802, a woman was born that would become one of the most well-known writers and thought leaders of her time. As a mostly self-educated single woman, she built a writing career that supported her family and launched her into academic circles. As a skilled storyteller, she distilled the ideas of the great thinkers of her time and made their works accessible to the masses. She traveled throughout the U.S. to discuss slavery with both abolitionists and supporters of slavery and then brought her observations and opinions about the budding democracy back to her readers in England. She was personally known by Queen Victoria and Charles Darwin and our very own Mariah Mitchell. It's hard to overstate just how prolific and influential she was in her lifetime. And yet, I bet dollars to donuts you have no idea who she is. Her name was Miss Harriet Martineau. And today, Reference Library Associate Jim Borzileri is going to tell you all about how she became the most famous woman you've never heard of. How did you even find her? Her books, you know, I think we were looking at the 1900 catalog and Mm -hmm. there were 19 of her books in there. And that was a pretty hefty load. And it's like, I had never heard of this person. So I think that was what got me curious. And then when I pulled up her Wikipedia page, the source of all, all knowledge. When I printed it out, it went on for nine pages, four pages of which were citations. I mean, this is obviously a very famous person. So who is she? Harriet Martineau was an English social theorist. And she's when she is remembered today, it's probably as being the first female sociologist. But she was more than that. She was very much a what we might now today call public intellectual. Probably her most scholarly work were her translations of uh, those from Auguste Comte, who is generally considered the father of sociology. She was translating from French to English. But if you ask the average person, she had gained a monstrously large following with very, very popular writing. She was writing fiction. She was writing nonfiction. She was a prolific journalist and a political advocate. She uh, also had made a name for herself writing nonfiction, explaining free market economics to a very general audience. She was also what we might now consider a a feminist. She was also an abolitionist. She traveled extensively and wrote about what she saw in the Middle East as well as in America. And her style is what made her because she was very much known as a storyteller. She would take these very deep, complex ideas and communicate them to a very broad audience, essentially either by use of fiction or by stories as analogies. For this, she was very, very well known in her time. And she was successful in us that she was able to uh, not only support herself, but also support a good part of her family, which was very, very unusual for women authors to do. In the 1841 catalog, you know, when she was just gaining her popularity, we had three books, but even in the 1900 catalog, after she had died, we still had 19 books in the collection and a couple of them were two copies, which means it was popular enough. We needed to have more than one copy available. Queen Victoria was a fan of hers, and enough that uh, when she was uh, at her coronation, she invited Harriet to attend for a Nantucket connection when Mariah Mitchell made her first trip to Europe. Part of her itinerary through letters of introduction was to go and visit her at her house. And she was so well known, in fact, that newspapers, when they referred to her, they just simply called her Miss Martineau. And everybody knew what she said. So they might say, you know, and then this is a event and we're waiting to hear the comment from Miss Martineau. Even though we've never heard of her, she was certainly popular in her own time. She kind of reminds me of Forrest Gump or Zelig or something like that. She was just kind of everywhere. She was kind of everywhere. I was trying to think it would be as if you somehow crossed Stephen King with a political figure. She was just sort of everywhere and just an incredibly prolific writer. 
She was born in 1802. She came from a family of well-to-do mill, mill owners who were also strong proponents of the Unitarian faith. Her childhood, though, was not exactly idyllic. Uh, in later years, she would she would characterize her mother as kind of distant, and it was that her sense of neglect that kind of influenced her attitude toward the role of women in society. So there was a kind of resonance there. She suffered in her life many, many health issues. Uh, she lost her sense of taste and smell when she was very young, and she began to lose her hearing in her adolescence. And given the technology of the time, uh, by 18, she was forced to use an ear trumpet which if you've ever seen those, it's just what it sounds like. It's a, it's a reverse trumpet that you place up to your ear so that people can speak into it and you can hear them talking. It really makes it almost even more re remarkable what she was able to accomplish. So talk a little bit about her career. Yeah, well, she began writing about 1821, first for some of the Unitarian journals. And even then there were tragedies. Uh, she had a, the brother that encouraged her to go into writing would pass away. Apparently she had a fiance who suffered some mental issues and he would later die. The big blow was in 1829 when the family business failed and her father died shortly thereafter. But all along she was just building a career as a writer. And she would later say that the business failing actually was one of the best things that ever happened to us because she says, finally, we can truly live rather than simply vegetate. Because what this also meant was she had to write to support her family. And now there was a, ju a socially justified reason for her being so prolific and writing so much. She had to do it because, you know, otherwise her family, you know, her family would have suffered. Again, she was already recognized for, you know, her writing in the Unitarian Journal. She also supplemented very early on her income by creating and selling works of needlepoint. You know, she was pretty versatile. But she also said later on that this financial responsibility being put on her shoulders kind of facilitated her fusing of her economic and her literary interests. What's striking looking back on it now is at the time, there were women writers. They were, you know, they certainly were out there, but they were usually confined to some very narrow topics, what was called domestic life and also fictional romances. In other words, sort of what we may think of as light fictional uh, literature, but Miss Martineau ignored this and she wrote on any topic that interests her, even the serious topics that were usually restricted to men, such as economics and politics and history. But when she did it, and this is the even more subversive part, she was doing it from a woman's viewpoint. She wasn't just aping the male viewpoint. She was asserting that not only were these topics of interest to women, but women might have a perspective that was very different from that that had traditionally been held by men. You know, starting about 1830, you know, so she's still in her early 20s, she made regular visits to London. She sort of fell into a, an intellectual circle around a prominent editor then called uh, William Johnson Fox. And that is where she met Erasmus Darwin. The last name should be familiar. This is Charles Darwin's brother. She and Erasmus started out and in, in to have a very long-term relationship of some kind. They were clearly very, very close. Because of her success in 1832, she got her first significant commission. And this was to create a book entitled Illustrations of Political Economy to explain the writings of Adam Smith. Tell us who Adam Smith is. He's pretty much remembered today for one book, and that is The Wealth of Nations. And this is the first significant work espousing what we might think of as free enterprise or the free market economy. It was written about 1776, but it's a very, very challenging work. Smith was a very gifted writer, but it's very dense. It's a thousand pages. And really, to actually read it, you've almost got to read his his first book, which was called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, because he sort of saw them as a piece. The Theory of Moral Sentiments was his view on political life, on morality, on what we should do and how we should behave as humans. And then Wealth of Nations is just sort of, okay, how does this apply to economics? How does this apply to business? So to read one without the other, you're only getting half the man. But that's two or 3,000 pages of very, very dense analytical work with digressions that go way off on something that you may wonder, why am I reading 50 pages on how, what wage earners in Northwest England are earning compared to wage earners in Northeast England? It's because it's Smith was all part of a piece, but we read it today and it's, it's going to be heavy going. And if I'm doing the math right, Miss Martineau is only in her early 30s or she's just turned 30 at this point. Yep. What education, what background, what qualifications did she have to do this? Or she just had a real like natural intelligence for this 
type of material. Well, clearly she had the intelligence, but her mother, whatever her other flaws, did believe that it was important for women to be educated. So even though she didn't have that much formal schooling, she was certainly learning and reading, and obviously the family library was open to her. Clearly she was a voracious reader and writer. So in a lot of ways she was self-taught, but she was, you know, I think we can safely say, brilliant. Not only could she absorb these ideas, but she was able to take them and create a story or an illustration that gets to the point of it that was easily understood by most people or even by, you know, a fairly casual reader. So she writes this book, How'd It Go? It went better than anyone had thought. I mean, again, her goal was to convey the ideas of Adam Smith to a very, very broad audience. Even though it was a commissioned work, the publisher thought, well, we'll be lucky if we sell 1,500 copies. And that was the initial print run. And it turned out to be a surprise bestseller. And eventually it would be selling in the numbers that only Charles Dickens could attain. What was it about the book that really interests people that made it a bestseller at the time? I think it, she was striking at just the right moment. Obviously, Smith's ideas had been percolating around for a while, but they were sort of in a very rarefied environment. And what she was saying is, no, these are principles you can live by. And we're sort of used to that concept today because we are taught about free enterprise. We're taught about personal property rights. It's sort of now built into our educational system. But back then, this was something new and unusual. And because she was trying to convey it in a way that could be reaching the broadest public, it sort of sparked a dialogue. Great storyteller or not, you might be wondering, like I am, why Miss Martineau's writing captured the attention of so many people. Granted, there was no television, video games, or social media, or other modern-day distractions, but it still seems curious that a book on economics and free markets would be flying off the shelves. To understand why it was popular, we have to sort of, sort of think about the world as it was in the 1830s in England. And it's completely different from what we think of today. To give you an idea, the English economy was still struggling with what was called, at the time, the mercantilist system. And this was an idea that the government controlled most of the commerce from the top down. So, for example, while she was writing this, it was a fact that all imports, as well as shipping, from China to England were controlled by one company that was operating under a charter from the crown and no other business could go into it. Now, this was about to change, but in 1832, that was a fact. And if you look at the election system, England was on the verge of a crisis at that point. Only 3% of the public could vote. A lot of the boroughs or electoral districts literally had no one in it. So if you were a landowner and that was in your district, you could just send someone to parliament and no one else could say anything about it. Meanwhile, if you were in, let's say, a factory town that had exploded, like Birmingham, which had gone from a fairly small trading mill to like this monster community, they were still based on population figures that had been set up in the 1600s. England came very, very close to revolution in the 1830s over just how much reform can we handle before we go too far. Given this kind of background, given this interest in how does one make money, what are my rights as an individual to earn a living, this was just the perfect moment for Adam Smith to suddenly be communicated out to a much broader audience than it had been up to that point. It almost seems like she kind of let the cat out of the bag and educated a lot of people that weren't. What impact did this have on her career? Was there pushback? They commissioned more books. So she wrote a series of these books, and each one was a bestseller. And what's also interesting is that when she was writing these, she was writing them in collaboration with her brother, James, who was a Unitarian minister, and they were very close at this point. You mentioned that she was commissioned to do this. Why do you think she said yes? She was a firm believer in the free enterprise system. She strongly believed it. And she thought that if the public understood the concept of these writers, then they would just naturally incorporate it into their lives and how they made their economic decisions. If that happened, you would have economic reform and economic growth from the bottom up, which definitely appealed to her politically. She also traveled quite a bit. So talk yeah, about some did. of her traveling. Well, in 1834 to 36, she visited the United States and Canada. She made a note that she had wanted to visit Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard because she heard there were some very unusual people there, but she couldn't, she couldn't make the trip. <laughs> but when she came over, she was very much an abolitionist. That was unpopular at that moment in the North and the South. There were a lot of people that didn't like slavery and they didn't want to see it expand. But the idea of abolishing slavery outright was not exactly a common view. 
When she was in Boston, she met with a very small abolitionist community who was there. But when she went down south, she had these very frank discussions, not just with the slave owners, but also with the wives and the daughters of the slave owners. And the topics were not just about the evils of slavery itself, but also its impact on women and families, and in particular, the abuse of female slaves by the slave owners, and also you know, what the repercussions of that abuse were as it moved down through the generations. I just can't help but go back to the fact that this is a woman in her 30s, traveling alone, presumably. Mm -hmm. What was it about her that people received her well and would meet with her and talk with her and she could connect with them? Well, because of her writings, they preceded her. And she was so prolific that they couldn't help but know something about what she'd written. And so, again, this is before we have mass media, before we have television, let alone the internet. Here's a chance to actually meet this person that you've only read on the printed page. So, of course, you'd go out of your way to meet her and talk with her, even if you didn't necessarily agree with her on everything. And I'm not sure she totally traveled alone. I think she did travel as part of a small group. But, yeah, it was still unusual because she was still considered to be, in one sense, unescorted. After she came back from America, she wrote what we would consider a sociological study of America at the time, trying to, again, analyze and explain America to a European audience. So like Tocqueville's America, once again, you've got a visitor who's coming and trying to sort of synthesize what they saw and convey it out to a broader audience in Europe. And she would have had an interesting perspective having not been American, but like de Tocqueville, going and really just being able to observe as an outsider. Yeah, especially because England had not only abolished slavery in the British Isles, they had recently abolished it across their colonies. So to suddenly go to a country where slavery is not only uh, still in existence, but it's still the basis for a significant portion of the economy and is still a very, very, very hot political issue is something that I'm sure would have attracted her interest. There's another interesting connection between Miss Martineau and de Tocqueville in that it's interesting she went and focused on slavery and was really compelled to make her observations, you know, publish that. Uh, and de Tocqueville, his original purpose for going to America before writing Democracy in America was to study and observe the penitentiary system. Although I think at that point, you know, she would have said she had no choice. I mean, it would have been impossible to talk about America without discussing slavery. Not only did it, as I say, permeate the economy, but it also dominated the political landscape. There was just no getting away from it at that point. Speaking of political landscape, tell me a little bit about what her views were. You mentioned she believed in free markets. What, uh -huh. you know, what other values and views did she have? She belonged to a political party that was known as the Whigs, and that's W-H-I-G. There was also a Whig party in the United States. We might think of them today if we had to classify them as kind of a pro-business, classical, liberal entity. Their strong beliefs were for religious tolerance and for free markets, but not necessarily radical change. Most of the major whale ship owning families on Nantucket were definitely Whigs. Most of the merchants on Nantucket were Whigs. So she sort of found a natural constituency there. And also this was one of the hotbeds for some of the abolitionist movement. They weren't the majority by any means, but they were certainly here and probably in slightly numbers than they would be elsewhere. And you would contrast the Whigs with the Tories, who were the traditional, essentially pro-aristocracy, pro-monarchist right. And then you would have on her left, and again, this is all 1830s, 1840s politics, so it doesn't quite map to ours, what were called the radical Whigs, who argued for a much broader suffrage and major election reforms, as well as economic reforms. So she was criticized by both those sides for either being too radical or not radical enough with her viewpoint. And I think also we should note that, you know, in terms of her beliefs, she was obviously a strong advocate for women's rights, both as equals and for education and for suffrage. Again, very few people could vote, but she felt that for the women that qualified, they should have the vote as well. And if you had to sort of summarize, I think her goal was a truly egalitarian society. In other words, it was equal for everybody with only modest variances in wealth. What's interesting about her teaching of free enterprise is that her argument was that if there was wealth inequality, if it was significant, that was a sign the economy was not being managed properly. So the remedy was not necessarily increased government control, but if 
again, if the public were educated and they understood their natural rights as property owners, meaning not just physical property, but also their bodies as their own property and their right to work as they saw fit, that if they understood this, then they would guide the economy to a more equal and more equitable outcome. And her approach to this, again, was to work as a storyteller. Would we call her a feminist today? Yeah, but I think with with some qualifications, she absolutely believed in the equality between men and women, but she also believed that women had a natural inclination for motherhood. And in this way, she was kind of stressing some of the characteristics that she felt her own mother had kind of lacked in her upbringing. But she also believed that the domestic sphere complemented women's education rather than served in opposition. So women naturally tended toward the domestic realm. Those were their interests. But at the same time, they also would naturally thrive in a, you know, as highly educated members of the society. I think somewhat unsurprising, though, she was critical of the necessity for marriage as it existed at that time. And she also did not shy from issues that were very controversial, such as contraception. I mean, she was fairly outspoken on both. What I want to ask is, did she get married and did she have children? Uh, No and no. But we don't know how much of that was political and how much of that was biological. Yeah. And and as I'm asking, I hesitated on that question because would a man be asked that question? And can her views, her outward views and how she lives her life personally, do they have to be completely in sync? But it is a valid question. No, I think we should just say in passing, no. Uh, We don't, you know, she clearly had a relationship with Erasmus. We don't know what happened with that. There's some indication that his family forbade it because she was a little too radical for them. Uh, She clearly had these health issues. And maybe she just thought it might interfere with her career. All we can say is there's indications of romantic relationships. She seems to have no interest in marriage. So she's at the height of her career. She's writing. She's prolific. Mm -hmm. People are just fascinated by what she has to say, even if they don't agree with her. She has very interesting, sometimes controversial views for a woman at that time. So what happens next for her? Unfortunately, some health issues intrude. In the early 1840s, uh, she developed what we think was uterine cancer. uh, And she became essentially an invalid for several years. And she was convinced she would remain that way for the rest of her life. But then what happened is in 1844, she underwent a course in mesmerism, hypnotism, by any other name, and she regained her health in a few months. She remained a proponent of mesmerism the rest of her life. In reality, we think what probably happened is somewhere in that time frame, the tumor must have shifted just enough to reduce the pain. She said, no, it's the mesmerism and and who knows. But in 1844, she wrote another one of her works, which is these days considered perhaps her most underrated work. And this was called Life in the Sick Room, where she candidly discussed her illness. And the book, when it came out, upset a lot of people for different reasons. The core of the book was that rather than just sort of accept your fate, you should proactively try and take charge to regain control of your life. So that upset the evangelicals because it was stressing self-reliance rather than faith. The medical community was upset because she was rejecting the idea, the idea of submitting to the doctors and what they told you to do to gain control. Others were just upset that she was publicly discussing an illness at all in public because that was extremely unusual, particularly one that was considered rather personal for women. And so overall, most of the critics dismissed the book entirely by just saying, well, the illness must have affected her mental abilities at least while she was writing. So we're just going to cast this book aside and sort of forget about it. And it was really only rediscovered later on in life. It would have been like a modern day memoir. Yeah, exactly. It was a modern day memoir about a very personal, very devastating event, which to us, we might take for granted. But at the time, it was kind of groundbreaking, particularly for its attitude and also for its candor. You know, this is Victorian England we're talking about. This was very, very unusual. Obviously, she did get better. And in 1845, she had kind of a back to the land moment, somewhat similar to someone coming to Nantucket. She designed and had constructed a house in the Lake District in England. And she began to write books about her gardening, travel guides, some of which stayed in print for about 25 years. And she also wrote a book called Household Education, which basically put forth her views of the abilities of women and criticized the state of education that was available to them at that time. 
The idea of that women were capable of higher education was hotly debated. There were people that thought that either one, they wouldn't be physically capable of handling it, or they wouldn't be mentally capable of handling it, or that if they did somehow survive, they would be transformed into something that was no longer feminine. So what happens next? And then she goes traveling again. She cares for her mother in the last years of her life. So there is a reconciliation. And then in 1847, 48, she travels to the Middle East where she had a spiritual epiphany. She sort of felt as she looked at the intersection of the Nile and the desert, that as civilizations advance, the concept of a deity becomes more and more abstract. And even though she doesn't specifically say it in the work, this really marks her move away from the Unitarian faith towards a kind of atheism but she never totally embraces atheism. She always sort of gets close, but never quite goes that far. But it absolutely strengthened her advocacy for a secular society. Unfortunately, it also really strained the relationships between herself and her brother, James. They had been devoted friends. So this, this really was something that kind of cast a shadow over their relationship. They would eventually reconcile, but it was still made for a couple of rough years. And then in 1855, she begins to suffer from the symptoms of heart disease. And once again, she believes that she's going to die soon. So she writes a very, very candid autobiography. As it turns out, she gets better. She lives for another 20 years, is productive almost until the end. For example, between 1852 and 1866, she's uh, contributed to the Daily News newspaper. It said that she was writing up to six letters to the paper a week. There are some journals where she contributed 1,600 articles. I mean, she was just incredibly prolific. In 1859, Darwin publishes his Origin of the Species. And it's possible that her writings on Malthus, it helped Darwin's thinking in terms of natural selection. Obviously, Darwin knew of her through Erasmus. So they had met several times. He considered her a very formidable intellect. And it's clear that she may have had an influence on him as well. In June of 1876, she dies of bronchitis in spite of all her illnesses, not long after her 74th birthday. So she lived a fairly long life, and certainly for that time, what they would have considered a very, very long life. Three years later, her autobiography is posthumously published, and that becomes yet another bestseller. Why doesn't anyone know about her? She is known in academic circles. Once you realize she's out there, you just suddenly realize you've read about her everywhere. I was looking through a, a journal of Mariah Mitchell's, and that's where I said, she not only spent the day with Ms. Martino, she also met her brother. So they were both sort of celebrities in England. So certainly everybody knew of them. We still have three of her books in the library collection today. So she's still around. I think where she has fallen off is just in the popular imagination. The problem with writing for newspapers and writing for journals is it's ephemeral. Those aren't necessarily going to remain. The book she wrote for children, children's books go in and out of fashion. Some of the fiction she wrote goes in and out of fashion. She wrote a book on the British control of India that must have been a very interesting book at the time. I'm sure it's still read by academics today, but it's not something that's going to necessarily excite the imagination. Her book on America is still around. As I said, we have one copy in the library, but it's not something that someone's going to necessarily go and pick off the shelf to read because it's about America in the 1830s. If you're interested in that period, yeah, absolutely, you're going to read it. But because she was so current, because she was so much a part of her time, as the time faded and the time moved farther and farther into the past, she just became naturally less relevant. I think this is an impossible question, but if she were alive today, what would she be doing? Yeah, that is a good question. I don't know, and I'm not even going to venture a guess. We are such a, a fractionalized and politically volatile culture right now that there are definitely groups that try and, we'll say, adopt her. But I don't think you could say for sure, because she was responding to the events on the ground as she was alive then. In our own lifetimes, we all evolve. We all change our minds. We all have political views that were very strong 20, 30 years ago, that eventually they're going to change, sometimes a little bit, sometimes a lot. And you look back and you go, oh, I'd never do that now. To try and figure out how someone who is so analytical and so insightful would look at our society today and what political views she would have. You know, I wouldn't even venture a guess.
This has been a production of the Nantucket Athenaeum. It was written, narrated, and edited by me, Janet Forrest. Special thanks to Jim Borzilleri for sharing his research, knowledge, and charming radio voice. Check the show notes for resources and other information, including a list of writers that Miss Martineau popularized for the masses. If you want a closer look into the 1841 and 1900 catalogs, go visit Jim in the Great Hall. The Nantucket Athenaeum is located at 1 India Street in Nantucket, Massachusetts. We'd love for you to stop by and say hello. Visit us online at nantucketathenaeum.org. Join us next week to see what else is on the shelves of York.